How the heck has it been two years since the PS5 came out? It feels like yesterday, although it might have actually been yesterday for some of you guys because it is still a bit of a struggle to actually get your hands on one. So for the PS5's second birthday, now seems like a good time to reflect on what Sony got right, got wrong, and also what goodies year three may have in store. And if you do enjoy this video and want to see more gaming stuff from me, then a cheeky like and subscribe will be lovely. Okay, now cards on the table. I love my PS5, but I also love my Xbox Series X for Game Pass, for Flight Sim, Forza, and more importantly, the fact that it matches my drinks cooler. But for me, it's games like this, the exclusives, and also things like the DualSense controller, the fact that all my mates play on PlayStation, which they didn't used to be, they all used to be on Xbox, uh, means that nine times out of 10, I am firing up my PS5 rather than my Series X. But as you guys know, it has not been smooth sailing for Team Blue, as actually being able to get your hands on one of these has been incredibly frustrating over the last two years. I mean, it's not surprising coming out of the pandemic with the chip shortages and the fact that Sony reckon they've shifted around 25 million of these bad boys. But then just as things start to get better, Sony goes and increases the price. In the UK, it's 30 pounds more expensive. It's 20% more expensive in Japan. And it's the same price in the US for some reason, which is a bit frustrating. And really at this point, you'd be expecting to see discounts or a PS5 Slim model come out, which is still rumored for the end of next year, 2023, perhaps with a detachable Blu-ray drive to keep the costs down, but the process of actually buying a PS5 has been a bit of a mixed bag. Anyway, let's move on and talk about the software. What has changed over those two years? Well, to their credit, we have had quite a few significant updates, although they have taken a while to roll out. For example, it took a year for Sony to enable the internal M2 SSD so you could expand the storage, and also to roll out VRR support for smoother gameplay assuming you have a compatible TV or monitor. And it took them nearly another year to finalize 1440p support, which is great if you're gaming on a Quad HD monitor, but the Series X had that since day one. As for hardware, we've had some nice new controller colors with matching and also quite pricey console covers. There's even a new DualSense Edge controller, Sony's answer to the Xbox Elite, which at $200 or about 210 pounds is basically half the cost of a PS5 digital edition. Ouch. And we've also had two new PS5 SKU revisions that are a touch lighter thanks to smaller heat sinks and motherboards. Although frustratingly, Sony has stuck with the same 825 gig SSD in the console itself, meaning you're pretty much guaranteed that you're gonna have to pay extra to expand it with an M2 SSD, or at the very least to plug in an external SSD uh, to offload your PS4 games. One thing that did surprise me though, is when I did my initial review of the PS5, and even like a year later, I was adamant that people should buy the physical edition, the one with the disc drive, because as many PS5 games can be upwards of 70 pounds or so, it can be very expensive actually buying the games and I figured the used market being able to buy and sell it or buy used games would be a big deal for most people but surprisingly according to Sony by mid 2022 almost 80% of PS4 and PS5 games were purchased digitally and I'm guessing that's mainly down to a convenience thing you don't have to physically buy the game and then also put it in the drive you can do it all from sitting on the sofa and also you can sometimes get some quite good deals on games even buying it through the PlayStation Store. Now, speaking of games, and obviously consoles live or die by these games, and particularly the exclusives. And I think over the last two years, and also looking forward, the PS5 does come out on top in terms of games. Although to be fair, many exclusives have found their way to PC, and arguably there aren't as many true exclusives as maybe you'd hope after a couple of years. But when we do get them, mm, they're fantastic. I loved Spider-Man Miles Morales, Returnal and Demon's Souls looked fantastic and played even better, and Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart was a ton of fun. Although I have to admit, I did fall off Gran Turismo 7 faster than I'd hoped. It still feels a bit soulless. But my all-time favorite games this generation are Ghost of Tsushima and Horizon Forbidden West. Although I have a feeling God of War might join those ranks. Ragnarok looks incredible, especially when you consider this is a cross-gen game. And that is one problem we're still seeing. You're not gonna get the full potential out of the PS5 when you still have to develop the game for a PS4. I mean, it's no bad thing for PS4 owners, but if you shelled out on a PS5, you want at least some true next-gen games that really push the hardware to its limits. I mean, two years in, I was hoping for some full fat PS5 only titles, something like that Matrix Unreal 5 tech demo, but perhaps just not at 15 FPS. But hey, at least there's a ton of exclusive games just around the corner, right? Well, apart from Spider-Man 2, Wolverine, and FF16, and a handful of others, and of course the PSVR 2, there aren't that many big exclusives due to arrive over the next year or so. Obviously though, more may be announced, and there's still plenty of cross-platform games that look really promising. 
But does the PS5 really make that much difference to your games anyway? Well, generally, PS5 versions of cross-gen games will have better image quality, higher frame rates, or both in many cases. Although in most games, you're still having to choose between visual fidelity that gets you that crisp 4K, highest graphics options, maybe a bit of ray tracing, or higher frame rates for a smoother gameplay experience. There's still a compromise to be had. Things are getting better though, like the updated RT performance mode in Spider-Man, and in Ragnarok, playing on a 120Hz capable TV in balance mode bumps the FPS to 40, up from 30, which is a noticeable difference while maintaining image quality, although of course 60fps is hard to beat. Having said all that though, if you don't own a 4K HDR TV that also perhaps supports 120Hz and VRR and all those gaming features, you're not really going to get the most out of your PS5 anyway. I mean, you're going to have your console for probably 10 years, so eventually you're going to upgrade your TV. But if you're still on a basic, smaller, full HD TV, given how many games are still coming to PS4, you're probably best off sticking with that. But then again, it's the quality of life stuff that makes the biggest difference when I play my PS5. And I think for me, it's the ultra fast load times that have been the biggest single upgrade on the PS5. It's even changed the way I play games. Spider-Man and Ratchet and Clank load in a handful of seconds, and Horizon Forbidden West takes seconds versus literally minutes on PS4. Fast travel is basically seamless, which makes a massive difference in keeping the action going in Ghost of Tsushima, and particularly in games like Elden Ring, where you die every five seconds, faster respawns are a lifesaver. Well, figuratively. I still die every five seconds, but there's just less of a gap between it. I also really enjoy using the DualSense controller. The adaptive triggers and haptic feedback can be great for adding resistance to weapons or adding an extra layer of immersion like when you move around different surfaces in Astro's Playroom or Tsushima. And the thump and fizzle of Returnal's crackly guns make great use of both. Although I must admit, in many games, the implementation can still feel a bit half-baked. And also, if you're playing online in competitive shooters like Call of Duty, then you're going to want to turn all that off anyway. Then there's the PS5's 3D spatial audio tech, which is pretty cool. I mean, technically it actually works with any speakers or headphones as it's processed by the PS5's Tempest audio engine, but for the best effect, you'll want to pair it with the official Pulse 3D headphones or one of the third-party alternatives that officially support the tech. And this lets you hear pinpoint environmental sounds around you accurately, and it's also just much more atmospheric. So plenty of hits then, but what about the misses? Well, for one thing, I still can't quite figure out why we can't have quick resume on the PS5. The Xbox has had it since day one, as switching on the PS5 requires a cold boot each time, whereas on the Xbox, you can quick resume between a handful of games instantly. I'm also still not the biggest fan of the UI. It's certainly better than the Xbox, but I think there's definitely room for improvement. And I also think the three tiers of PS Plus and also PS Now can be all a bit confusing. I do still love the design of this thing though, although the glossy black trim shows up dust and scratches very easily, especially around the ports, and it is still bloody massive. And also, the PS5 box does still come with a nice big 8K logo, but unsurprisingly, support for 8K has never really materialized. Now, I know my wife is very excited for the new Harry Potter game. That'll be coming, I think, early next year. But as well as that, one thing I'm looking forward to is the PSVR 2, something that Team Green with Xbox just don't have anything like. And although on paper, it does seem like it's going to be a big step up over the original PSVR, and I do like the idea of Resident Evil and Horizon Call of the Mountain, but I am still a bit skeptical, because the usual problem with VR is maintaining quality releases over time and Sony will have to keep supporting studios over the long haul, and I hope it doesn't divert too many resources away from regular first-party games. Oh, uh, I've got to talk about PS Plus, haven't I? Let's get it over with. Okay, PlayStation Plus. The rollout of the three tiers was definitely confusing and which got what content, but I think it is a little clearer now. Having the option of a Game Pass style game library with the mid-level extra tier sounds great, as is being able to stream games, including some classic PlayStation titles with the top premium tier. But in reality, the library just doesn't get the day one AAA releases that you get on Game Pass, even for a similar price per month. And I know it's subjective, but there are barely any classic titles that I'd actually want to play. So all in all, I'd probably recommend the extra tier, as having the game library is a great way of trying out new games, and it's not that much more than the base tier, which still gets the usual two or three free games per month. So let's wrap up, and I think two years in, happy birthday by the way, PS5, I think it's just starting to hit its stride, and usually if we look back at previous console generations, it's usually year three, four, and five that it really starts to get good, with the best games that really push the system to its limits. 
What I would say though, is if you are looking to get a PS5 now, I would also budget for a M2 SSD to expand the storage and also a second DualSense controller. And actually speaking of peripherals and accessories, I did make a big top 10 list of things that you should buy and things that you shouldn't buy, which I'll leave a link to up there and also at the end of the video. But I guess my main problem with the PS5 is that if you do already have a PS4 and you're having a great time, given that games like Ragnarok are also coming to the PS4, you could probably still hold off for another six months or a year. I mean, sure, the PS5 offers quality of life improvements, better controllers, faster load times, better graphics with higher frame rates, but I think when all said and done, when we look back, it's the games, the stories, the narrative, the innovative gameplay that we really appreciate, and not that it has ray tracing or it's 40 FPS instead of 30. But what do you think? Do you have a PS5 and what's your experience so far and what's your favorite game? Let me know in the comments below. And if you don't yet have one, why not? Let me know. Thank you so much for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time right here on the Tech Chat.